Noam Chomsky has revolutionized the way many of us view and understand the world. Whether it be through linguistics and his groundbreaking theory on universal grammar, his piercing analytical and conceptual framework for understanding political and human affairs, or his moral and ethical dedication to being a voice for those without one. Arguably the greatest intellectual of the last 100 years, and I can go on. I spoke with him about the ongoing affairs within Israel-Palestine and how it interacts with the rest of the world's affairs. Israel-Palestine connects three continents, is a meeting place of cultures, ideas, and groups for millennia. From before the Roman era, to the Arab conquests, to the Crusades, the Ottoman Empire, the rise and implementation of Zionism, and its spurring of the Arab-Israeli conflict, and everything in between, this small piece of land and the Middle East as a whole can often be seen as a pulse for the ongoings of the rest of the world. The newly elected right-wing government in Israel is trying to overhaul the judicial system. Israeli citizens are protesting in mass, leading organizations in the Jewish diaspora community and Jewish leaders around the world are publicly criticizing Israel and its new leaders. The Palestinians in the West Bank are split, splintering and new factions are arising. Violence between Israelis and Palestinians have crescendoed the past year. U.S. and Israeli tensions are increasing as the Biden administration recently publicly criticized Israel. President Biden, President Biden criticized Netanyahu and Netanyahu fired back. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia and Iran have come to a peace agreement for normalization, which was brokered by China and not the United States. This despite just months ago, Netanyahu publicly declaring that one of his goals in his new term was to come to a peace agreement with Saudi Arabia, Arabia and further isolate Iran, which he publicly considers an existential threat to Israel. So it's a tall order, but uh, maybe that's the point for us to discuss it. Um, I was looking to start with Israel's domestic and judicial issues. Um, and just the judicial overhaul and the domestic unrest. Um, there's division between the right and the left, uh, between ethnic and cultural groups in Israel. Uh, how do you feel about what's going on there? And where do you suppose this is leading? Well, first of all, I wouldn't call it right and left. There's almost no left in Israel. What there was, there was a strong left. It's very marginal, almost disappeared. Uh, there is a struggle going on between the more secular, uh, uh, moderately liberal Jewish society of Israel and uh, another sector in Israel probably the majority it's uh, can't write them off uh, the there has been a long split between the uh, so-called Mizrahi population the population that's all or partly of basically Arab Jewish origin uh, they've been they're, they're the ones who uh, in Hillary Clinton's famous terms have been called the deplorables They've been very poorly treated. I've seen it myself, but for throughout the whole period of the history of Israel, it's been run by a mostly Ashkenazi elite. There's a lot of bitterness among the uh, Mizrahi population, who happen to be many of them, not all, but many, uh, very religious, uh, living in communities controlled by uh, religious by rabbis, reactionary rabbis. Uh, so there's a, and they have managed to essentially take control of the government. They're also led by groups that are proto-fascist, violently anti-Palestinian. There are brutal, thuggish organizations like uh, La Familia soccer clubs, or Beitar soccer clubs, or Lava, racist organization. Their leadership is now top of the government. So Schmutrich, Ben Gvir, right at the top of the government. Netanyahu had to form a 
to, to form a coalition which would keep him in power and incidentally out of jail. Uh, he had to bring in these elements. They are now dominant elements. Well, what's happening is uh, an uprising of the secular, more westernized, uh, uh, more educated part of the population against the religious nationalist takeover. It was described very well by Amira Haas, is one of the leading uh, Israeli, one of the last residues of the Israeli left, uh, a fine essayist, uh, uh, journalist, um, gave up living in Israel a long time ago, now lives in Ramallah on the West Bank, one of the most astute uh, commentators on Israeli society, writes in Haaretz. Recently, she described what's happening, I think, accurately. She said, for many years, Israel has pretended that it's a state, a democratic state with an army that happens to have a secular, uh, a settler enterprise in the occupied territories. But the reality is, it's a settler enterprise with a state and an army. And now the settler enterprise has turned against privileged, educated, secular Israeli Jews, not just against Palestinians. They don't like them. And that's what the uprising is about. It's about the fact that the settler enterprise is now moving to Israel proper and attacking the sec more secular, more educated, more liberal Jewish population, the kind of people we'd be likely to be. It's going after them. They don't like it, and they're demonstrating in the streets. It's very serious for Israel. One of the most, you read the Israeli commentators, especially the military analysts like Amos Harel and others, what's really worrying them is that the army's beginning to be harmed. The uh, reservists who keep, the reservists are the ones who basically keep the army function, especially the elite units like the Air Force. Reservists come for regular training. They're the backbone of the uh, Air Forces, other elite units. Uh, lots of them are just refusing to go for training. They don't want this to happen to the Israeli society. And they have a, another concern, a direct concern, which they're voicing. As long as Israel can present itself as being a, to the West, as being a democratic society with a judicial system, as long as it can present itself in that way, they are immune to international investigation. They bomb a home in Gaza and kill a couple of dozen people. They're not going to be investigated because Israel can argue, well, we have a judicial system, we'll investigate it. Take away this facade, they're open to national investigation for the constant crimes that they're committing. It's not a small point. It's not very far in the background. So the facade of a functioning judicial system is very significant. Now you take a look at that facade, uh, it's more nuanced. For Israeli society itself, Israeli Jews, especially the more privileged of them, there is a judicial system. For the Palestinians, there's nothing. The vaunted Supreme Court uh, supports all the most ugly uh, crimes committed against the Palestinians. In fact, the Israeli Supreme Court is, I think, probably the only judicial body in the world that refuses to concede that there are occupied territories. The official Israeli line is there's no occupied territories, just administered territories. It's a military administration. It's not occupied. And nobody accepts that. Even the United States never accepted that. And certainly international institutions don't accept it. But 
the Israeli Supreme Court accepted it, which allowed them to support the settlement activities, destruction of villages, uh, building of a, a, a kind of a greater Israel incorporating much of the occupied territories within Israel. They, occasionally they'll oppose some action, but symbolic mostly, they basically approve it. So for the Palestinians, there's no judicial authorities. Well, now it's coming home to secular Israelis too, that the, the religious nationalist majority in the parliament, which has taken over the parliament, the Knesset, can undermine the judiciary that works for them. They don't like them. It's, uh, we could think of analogies in the United States easily, uh, not exact, but similar. Uh, the uh, uh, and that's what the protests are about. As Amira Haas put it, the settler enterprise, which basically runs the society, is now moving to Israel proper and imposing itself on the privileged, educated, westernized elite. And they are reacting, including those who, they're the ones who keep the military working, not the religious students studying in uh, religious institutions, which are kind of like madrasas. They're not, they don't serve in the army, they don't do work for the state, religious nationals. Uh, Knesset is now trying to increase funding for them to give them even more privileges. So there's a lot of internal struggle underway. For Netanyahu himself, there's another issue. If the courts continue to function, he'll probably end up in jail. So he's got a personal stake in what's going on. Yeah. The Saudi yeah. thing that you mentioned, uh, the Saudi issue is extremely important, very important. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel have had, technically they've been enemies, but in fact, since 1967, they've had tacit friendly relations. Uh, 1967, it's important to remember what happened then. Uh, prior to 1967, 67 war, the United States had supportive relations to Israel, but they were not all that unusual. For example, the main military support it was France. Support for its nuclear programs was France. The United States didn't particularly like them. 1967, that changed radically. Uh, Israel became the leading, uh, what's called strategic asset of the United States. Close relation developed, has no parallel in international affairs. Uh, the, what happened is that Israel performed a huge service to the United States and Saudi Arabia at the time. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt were actually at war, proxy war in the Yemen, serious war. They represented two different elements in the Arab world. Uh, Egypt represented secular nationalism. Saudi Arabia represented radical Islam. Uh, the British, when they were running the place, tended to support radical Islam against secular nationalism, which they regarded as much more dangerous to the imperial project. The United States took over, and same thing, much more supportive of radical Islam than secular nationalism, which threatens the uh, maintaining imperial domination. Well, in 1967, Israel smashed the forces of secular nationalism Nasser's Egypt, and supported Saudi Arabia, radical Islam. The U.S. policy changed dramatically. Saudi Arabia, and of course, Israel and Saudi Arabia became tacit allies. They have the same basic interests. In fact, uh, you look at U.S. serious analyst, military, other intelligence analysts at the time, they regarded U.S. policy in the following years in the Middle East as based on what were called three pillars, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Iran. Iran was then under the Shah, a firm U.S. ally, brutal, 
vicious dictator who the U.S. was strong, had put into power and was strongly supporting. Technically, the three of those countries were at war. Saudi Arabia knew it well, but that was technically. In fact, they had pretty good relations among them. A lot of this came out publicly after the Iranian dictatorship was overthrown in 79. Relations between Israel and Iran were particularly clo very close, but also with Saudi Arabia. Well, those are the three pillars on which U.S. power was based. Iran became an enemy in 79. Now the important for the United States and Israel is to mobilize the Arab dictatorships in opposition to Iran. That's the base for U.S. domination and power in the region. The Abraham Accords kind of formalized an alliance of the most reactionary states, uh, tacitly including Egypt, brutal dictatorship. Um, Israel provides the muscle and technology directed against Iran. China just threw a wrench into that. Seriously. Nobody expected that. Uh, and it went beyond that. A couple of days ago, Saudi Arabia joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's uh, based in China, of course. It's the basis for the spreading of Chinese power and influence over Eurasia, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the uh, investment development programs reaching to the Middle East, to Africa, to South Asia, or even to Latin America, where countries are joining in. Now Saudi Arabia has joined. Actually, earlier, the United Arab, United Arab Emirates, the other major oil producer dictatorship, had partly joined China. China has what's called a maritime Silk Road. There's the developments on land through Eurasia, but there's also a maritime development program right along the southern shore of the Eurasia that leads into the Red Sea. United Arab Emirates is one of the key points in it, in the Maritime Silk Road. So this is China, this is more of China's expanding its influence and power in the region. The United States doesn't like it at all, as you can imagine. And now with Saudi Arabia has been in, you know, just can't even call it an ally. It was so close to the United since its existence, it, it came into existence in the 1930s. It's just been a, you know, a U.S. Uh, satellite. You just take it for granted that Saudi Arabia would pull out is very dramatic. First of all, it has most of the oil, enormous wealth, and it's been the center of U.S. power, along with Israel since 67. Well, this is shattering a lot of problems and illusions. Uh, for Israel itself, it means the far-right government in Israel, which wants to uh, develop, of course, wants to uh, go to create a uh, an alliance with the Arab dictatorships under the Arab Abraham Accord in a conflict with Iran. That's this is a serious blow to it. Nobody knows where it's going to lead exactly. What Saudi Arabia is doing is incidentally what's happening in a lot of the third world. India, Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil. Uh, they're not going along with US policy in many respects war in Ukraine as well. They've refused to take part in U.S. sanctions. They're not agreeing to U.S. policy there. Uh, moving towards independent arrangements, independent relations with China, with Russia, with each other, and so on. These are big changes in the general shape of world order. The Middle East is, as usual, right at the center of them with complicated ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, you touched on a lot of points there. Um, going back to Egypt and Saudi Arabia, um, representing different ideologies uh, amongst the Arab world, and um, certainly the involvement of China and the changing world order. Um, how do you feel, you know, we were just talking about 
Israel and their domestic issues. And before we expand into sort of the grander international scope of things, um, if you don't mind, I was hoping we could discuss the Palestinian domestic issues. Um, there seem to be new factions arising, a lot of splintering going on. The Lion's Den, which is mostly a small collection of Palestinian youth who, despite their size, have support amongst Palestinians in the West Bank, namely for their proactivity and non-complacency for the status quo of being under Israeli military occupation. Uh, it's believed that Hamas and Islamic Jihad actors are covertly supporting and partaking in the activity of the Lion's Den, partially in order to destabilize the Palestinian Authority and subvert the credibility of Fatah, the ruling party in the West Bank. According to the New York Times, the majority of Israelis and Palestinians believe a third intifada, which is a Palestinian, violent Palestinian uprising, the last one being in 2005, over 3,000 people dying, is likely. And the majority of Palestinians, according to the New York Times, in the West Bank and Gaza support this. Um, what do you make of this? How does this affect Israel and the Palestinians' future? And like to tie it to the, the world order and how the Middle East is off in the center of things, if you want to expand into uh, the greater scope of that, you know, please go ahead. Well, we should start by the question of what the status quo is. What's the status quo that's being protested? The status quo for the last 50 years since the 67 war is a steady, consistent, systematic Israeli program to create a kind of greater Israel uh, in the occupied territories. That means Israel, first of all, takes over what's called Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a greatly expanded area, maybe five times what historic Jerusalem was, which includes Palestinian towns and villages in the surrounding area. They've been expelled or suppressed, and Israel takes over all of that huge area of greater Jerusalem, takes over, it, uh, develops towns and settlements deep inside the occupied territories. Mala Dumim, which is east of Jerusalem, was built mostly in the Clinton years. By now, a pretty large town, uh, subsidized villas, uh, nice place, nice suburb, you get subsidized towns, the super highways that lead you to your job in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. You don't even know there's an Arab anywhere, just for Jews only, Israelis only, and visitors. Another that almost bisects the West Bank, uh, take over the Jordan Valley. It's about a third of the Arab, arable area, kick out the Palestinians, prevent their development, uh, smash up their uh, European-provided um, solar panel, anything, just kick them out and take it over. Uh, other salients north of Maladumim, town of Ariel, and deep in the West Bank, uh, Kadumim, others. And take a look at the map, you can see it. The idea is to essentially break up the settled areas, take over whatever's of value to Israel, slowly integrate it into Israel, uh, leave out the heavy population centers so Israel doesn't want Palestinians within greater Israel. Which the idea is ultimately to annex it, but all of this is done slowly, step by step, so it's under the radar. You know, just do a little bit here, a little bit there, and so on. But the program's very systematic, was laid out clearly at the beginning. Uh, by now, the Palestinians in the areas that Israel's taking over are s separated into, I think it's about 160, 170 small enclaves surrounded by Israeli soldiers who will occasionally, if they feel like it, let the Palestinians out to and their flock or what are their plant their farms or maybe pick up things, maybe they won't let them out. Subject to constant attacks, almost daily attacks by uh, what are called settler youth, hilltop youth, 
young settlers who were mostly religious nationalists, very brutal, and just go in and smash up a Palestinian village, kill some people if they feel like it. So all of the, the ideas at a low enough level, level so you don't get a huge international protest. But that's daily life in the West Bank. The idea is, it's, I mean, by now the international human rights organizations are calling it apartheid. My own view, it's much worse than apartheid. South Africa depended on its black population. That was 85% of the population. It was the workforce. Uh, they, in fact, when they set up banter stands, they tried to get some international recognition for them, the homelands, uh, give them a little support. Israel doesn't want that, just wants to get rid of the Palestinians. Get rid of them somehow, fine. Uh, if by force, by force, if you can manage, if make luck livable, maybe they'll go away. What will be left are some scattered peasants and a couple of uh, population concentrations which will be surrounded like Nablus can't develop. Uh, like any neo-colonial power, Israel is catering to the Palestinian elite. and standard neo-colonial policy. You go to the poorest uh, African country, there's going to be some town where the rich elite do fine, you know, supported by the West, with imperial power. So in Ramallah, uh, you can live a Western life, restaurants, theaters, nice life for the elite. Go a couple miles into the countryside, it's pretty brutal. I don't know if you've been there, I have, but it's obvious. Uh, and that's, so that's, uh, that's the West Bank. With regard to the Golan Heights, the United States, Israel basically kicked out the pop, most of the population, just took it over. Uh, all of this, incidentally, is in violation of strong Security Council resolutions, which even the United States signed, um, demanding that all of this stop. Jerusalem, Golan Heights, all illegal posed by the entire world, but Israel just slowly goes ahead. By now, the, under Trump, the U.S. just authorized it, first time, officially, uh, both Golan and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Greater Jerusalem. He moves the embassy there and so on. Biden's going along with that. Now, what about Gaza? It's a monstrosity. That's one of the worst tragedies in the world couple million people, uh, no water to drink, no, virtually no electricity, no sewage, or fishermen can't go out in the ocean, they're blown. The idea is just strangling. Uh, uh, by now, the, the new religious nationalist government, the new one that came in, has actually authorized resettlement of Israelis in Gush Katif in Gaza doubt that they're going to implement it, but uh, it's symbolic. Uh, the, uh, they've also authorized settlement in the northwestern part of the occupied territories, what they call Samaria. Uh, yeah. They get run blocked. It's gone that far. Uh, but uh, the, the policies with various slight variations have been pretty systematic. Didn't matter who was in power. Shimon Peres, Yitzhak Rabin, Ehud Barak, uh, Menachem Begin, one or another variation of the same policies. The United States pretends it doesn't notice, it pretends it's, it's enough below the radar so you can still say, well, we believe in a democratic, popular, this and that. And now it's getting to the point where it's hard to pretend. It's gotten so hard to pretend that the major human rights organizations are calling it apartheid. And the US, US remains virtually alone in uh, claiming that nothing's happening and so on and so continued massive support. Even that's beginning to slightly erode in the United States. By now, uh, public opinion is shifting. So among Democrats, uh, Recent polls more support Palestinians than support Israelis. That's a big change from the past. Support for Israel in the United States has used to be based on liberal 
elites, liberal de- educated de- Democrats mostly, that's disappearing, especially among young people, even young Jews. It's, it's shifting to evangelicals, uh, nationalist right, uh, military security systems, uh, very close relations to Israel, but uh, big shift. Uh, the uh, All these things are changing as the facade lifts, but we should recognize that the status quo is 50 years of severe, constant repression, often violence, dispossession, and so on. So when young Palestinians are objecting to that, you can see what they're objecting to. It's a permanent system of violence and repression aimed at getting rid of them and making their lives impossible. So yes, you're getting groups like the Lion's Den who say, we're not going to take it anymore. If we have to get killed, we'll get killed, but we're going to resist. And then of course, Israel comes in with massive force. Maybe it'll lead to a new intifada. Uh, Yes, that's, uh, but it's not just to talk about rising violence is a little misleading. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, once again, a lot covered there. Um, You know, I was curious about, you mentioned how the sort of uh, public opinion in the United States has changed uh, incrementally and how this is much different than it was previously. Um, This is something that has interested me, particularly as it corresponds, and this is something you've covered a lot regarding propaganda in the United States and corporate media. Um, Historically in the past, uh, for as long as I can remember, dominant corporate media outlets in the United States have towed the main narrative regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and really a core narrative for general Israeli affairs, which is that Israel is doing its best in a hostile political landscape, that it's constantly under siege, and that its policies, even the controversial ones like Palestinian house demolitions and disproportionate force, are mainly for security purposes. Like you said, it's kind of like this uh, sort of, it's not deep or nuanced, but it's a general narrative that's towed. Uh, I've also noticed that there's been cracks in this narrative, not just in perception as it pertains to public opinion, and this might be uh, connected, but just regarding corporate media messaging, the typical outlets that you're used to are discussing the controversial nature of Itamar Ben-Gavir and Bezalel uh, Smotrich. They've talked more about Palestinian rights, again, like the, the standard, the, the, M- the NBCs, the CNNs. Uh, they've talked about Palestinian legitimacy to having their own state in historic Palestine, even if just peppering it in. It's just a little different than the traditional narrative. And I also recently saw a piece discussing Smotrich's Smotrich's recent comments about there being no such thing as a Palestinian, and also him speaking in front of a map that depicts Israel as larger, encompassing parts of Jordan and other areas around it. Um, Generally speaking, the tone has been, how now has been, how could he say something like that? How could he do that? Um, Again, amongst corporate media outlets um, and corporate and just periodicals, that are owned by corporate media outlets. Additionally, uh, leading Jewish diaspora organizations are criticizing this as well, almost lock and step. Um, but there's been a longstanding view, um, and you, anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, amongst many in Israel and those in the Jewish diaspora community who have supported in some form, obviously not all in any way, but uh, certainly enough have supported Israeli territorial expansion or have religious, uh, or those who have religious or ultra-nationalist connotations towards Zionism uh, espouse these views of there not being a Palestinian and like you mentioned, greater Israel, suggesting their national identity was conjured up in response to the rise of Zionism. Um, This sentiment, from my standpoint, at least observing it, seems to have been echoed for decades perhaps more privately um, amongst Israeli political elites. And again, has only recently come up in the mainstream and amongst diaspora leadership groups and leaders and spotlighted. Curious, just connecting that to what you were saying, um, 
what do you make of this shift? Is it is it corresponding to public sentiment? Is it what's the chicken? What's the egg? You know. Well, first of all, the sentence, the statement that there's no Palestinians goes back to Golda Meir, the hero of the American uh, liberal establishment, said there's no such things as Palestinians. She was told to keep quiet. You're not supposed to say things like that. Now, Smotrich, Netanyahu, and others say it openly. The idea that the Palestinians came in, as which you quoted from Netanyahu, as the result of the Jewish uh, development of Palestine, brought in Palestinians, that is now considered outrageous. And it go back 30 years. That's Joan Peters, a uh, hero of the left. Joan Peters wrote a best-selling book. She probably didn't write it, but she was put up as the front, uh, saying this nice young American woman, attractive young woman, pacifist, uh, went to Palestine, all pro-Israel, and discovered this amazing thing that the Palestinians were never there. They just came in after the Jewish uh, immigration. It was a bestseller. Hundreds of laudatory reviews from left commentators and others. It was a wonderful thing ever. You know. It was, of course, a total fraud was exposed by Norman Finkelstein. He had a very hard time getting anyone to pay attention. I was directly involved in that myself, trying to get somebody. Nobody would look at it, because uh, we don't want to hear that. We want this story. And that was then. Now it's now. Indicative of the change. Many other examples. I mean, for decades, I've been talking about these issues since the late 60s. I had to have police protection at campuses. If I was giving a talk on Israel-Palestine, even my own campus, campus police, city police, protect from uh, Zionist violence. Nobody thought there was anything wrong with that. That's fine. It's so outrageous. How, how should you be allowed to talk about it? It's called cancel culture today, but it's been raining for decades, standard not just on this issue. Well, a couple of years ago, it changed. And you can time the change very clearly. Cast lead, the cast lead assault on Gaza in 2008-9, somehow that broke the dam. Uh, especially young people are just not going to take it anymore. It was too grotesque, too outlandish. Obama's attitude was awful, turned people against him. Uh, since then, you can see an enormous difference, particularly on campuses. The support for Palestinians is far beyond for uh, what you can get from Israel. No police protection, big crowds, and so on. Incidentally, who was responsible for, for the crimes in caste led? Who was the general in charge? Yoav Gallant, the guy who is now the hero of the Israeli left because he was kicked out as defense minister by Netanyahu for making some statements. Shows you how the shift is, what the shift to the right has been there. Yeah. Well, the shift towards, I wouldn't call it the left, but towards something like the international consensus has taken place here. Well, that's significant. It's gotten to the point where uh, a couple of years ago, one congresswoman, Betsy McCollum, uh, put in a resolution, which of course was defeated uh, overwhelmingly, calling for looking at U.S. aid to Israel, which actually violates many U U.S. laws. She was dismissed. Now, Bernie Sanders just came with a similar resolution. He's harder to dismiss. Bernie Sanders and Jamal Bowman just came with a resolution uh, pointing out that Israeli aid should be reconsidered in the context of U.S. law, the so-called lay law, which bans U.S. military aid to units abroad which are engaged in systematic human rights violations. Uh, the IDF is involved in constant 
human rights violations in the occupied territories that questions the legitimacy of U.S. aid. There are other questions. Notice that the United States does not officially recognize that Israel has nuclear weapons. Of course, everybody knows that it does, but the U.S. doesn't recognize it. If you recognize it, brings in U.S. law, which raises questions about giving military or any aid to countries that develop nuclear weapons outside the NPT framework. So we don't talk about that. Now let's go back to propaganda. It's a very dramatic fact about the effectiveness of propaganda. More Americans, about 60%, more Americans believe that Iran has nuclear weapons than think that Israel has nuclear weapons. That's effective propaganda. Even American intelligence doesn't say that Iran even has nuclear programs, let alone nuclear weapons. Israel obviously has an enormous arsenal. Americans believe the opposite. That's decades and decades of not it's kind of indirect propaganda, dog whistles. Nobody comes out and says, Iran has nuclear weapons, Israel doesn't, you'd be laughed at. But it's implied in various ways such that people come to believe it. It's much like the uh, invasion of Iraq. You take a look at US attitudes, public attitudes, at the time of the invasion of Iraq. Majority of the US population believed that Saddam Hussein was involved in 9-11, which is Total insanity, uh, obviously total, not only false, but ludicrous. Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda were bitter enemies. Well, nobody came out and said directly, Saddam sent the airplanes. But there was enough subtle propaganda disseminated by the government and the media to make people believe it. It's amazing what you can do with a propaganda system. We have many examples. This is one. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, one thing I think about myself is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is so much in the public consciousness around the world. Everybody is aware of it far more than almost any other conflict on earth now and historically. At least that's how it feels. It feels like everybody has some sort of um, intellectual investment in it against their choice because of how much it has been communicated through the airways over decades and decades. And yet it's fascinating to me how little is actually known about it in terms of anything besides broad concepts like these two groups are fighting over the same land. You know, you, just as an example, like the Iron Wall policy um, by Vladimir Jabot Jabotinsky, um, which is really a guiding concept within Zionist thinking and Israeli policy. Nobody would e nobody has e has any idea what that is. You know, not even an inkling. And you know, I just think you can go down the line with with different thoughts and ideas uh, and policies. No one knows what Fatah is. No one. You know, these are very important concepts amongst a very popular. Um, conflict or, or notorious conflict, and yet, you know, you can't find anybody who, in the general public, sorry, go ahead. That's less of a paradox than you think, okay. because I disagree with the first part. It's been very little discussed. Okay. That's why nobody knows about it. I know this from personal experience. The effort over the last 50, 55 years to talk about it has been almost totally suppressed. As I said, couldn't even talk at a campus without police protection. Bitter condemnations and denunciations. It's not just the corporate media, it's the uh, liberal media. Uh, take the New Republic, uh, it was under, it's changed recently. A lot has changed in the last couple of years, but until very recently, it was a super right-wing Israeli, pro-Israeli popular uh, a journal. That's the traditional journal of the American liberalism. 
take the New York Review of Books, which uh, is you know, the leading journal for liberal intellectuals, couldn't mention Israel, literally. I mean, I knew the editor and the people very well. Simply couldn't mention it. It was a holy cow. Uh, recently, they've changed. Now you can start having articles about the occupation written by Israelis. Notice that's safe. Right. You're covered if you let an Israeli write about it. But uh, that's a big change just in the last couple of years. Uh, when you go back to the real, the worst Israeli crime of during these periods was the invasion of Lebanon, uh, uh, 1982. No pretext whatsoever. Murders, brutal invasion, killed about 20,000 people, devastated southern Lebanon, uh, left uh, the country for almost 20 years under occupation by Israeli surrogate forces in violation of UN declarations, one after another crime, nothing. Couldn't talk about it in the nation, couldn't talk about it in the New York Review, nowhere. I know very well, because I tried hard, uh, absolutely not. Uh, the, uh, uh, and the picture that's been presented is what you described. Israel's in a terrible neighborhood, has security problems, it, uh, has to defend itself, maybe it does some bad things, but that's almost the opposite of the facts. Israel has been the aggressor nation. Back in 19, in the 1970s, early 70s, the UN Security Council debated a resolution calling for a two-state settlement on the international border with guarantees for the rights of each state to live in peace and security within secure and recognized borders, it was supported by the main Arab states, supported by Egypt, Jordan, Syria, main states. Israel bitterly opposed it. Yitzhak Rabin was a UN ambassador, denounced, bitterly denounced it. Israel refused even to attend the session. The United States vetoed it. Well, what Israel and the United States were saying right then is, we don't want peace. We don't want security. We want expansion, Israeli expansion, then mostly into the Sinai, West Bank, Gaza, and so on, Golan Heights. No security problem. They created the security problem by rejecting a political settlement it was not just then, it's continued for years. Take a look at the list of US vetoes. Take a look at votes in the General Assembly. It's like a, you get votes 150 to three. United States, Israel, maybe El Salvador, some US dependency. This almost never gets reported, but uh, it's been the consistent policy of blocking security, blocking political settlement in favor of expansion. And it's not just talk. U.S. gives direct massive support for it, support that's way out of line of anything else in international affairs. Well, then yes, you get the media giving the standard story, the moral embattled Israel uh, defending itself from attacks. Almost the opposite of the truth. Well, now it's finally beginning to seep through, partly because the, right now, clearly because the secular, westernized part of the population itself is being attacked. They're not the attackers anymore. They always were, they still are. But now they're getting attacked, and that's no good. We don't want that. It's. Uh, uh, so, yes, you're getting a shift. Yeah. Speaking of the, uh, the unconditional U.S. support that you discuss and um, your inability to speak on campus and how many people have, you know, you said you needed police protection. You discussed what normal Finkel, Norman Finkelstein uh, had, or Finkelstein had to go through. And... Um, what I'm curious about is um, 
like you said, no matter what Israel's policies have been, the U.S. has supported it, whether in the U.N., through funding, military aid, rhetoric, whatever you, whatever it is, they support it. Um, historically, my understanding is that you have not subscribed to the idea that APAC, uh, the Israel lobby, is the primary cause of this for this sort of unison support and unconditional support by the United States. Um, regardless of the reasons though they are important, um, as the world changes and China rises and any shift in American interests um, occur through that, I'm curious how you feel that, and you could take this wherever you want, but I'm curious however you feel that could affect the disposition towards Israel, uh, the U.S. disposition towards Israel, and how this could affect Israel's expected maneuverability, both with the Palestinians, with their neighbors, and also, like you said, with with the left, which who has been buried in a lot of ways due to U.S. support, because through U.S. support, the the uh, the right has been able to really act without repercussion and without any sort of feedback from the outside world as to whether or not there should there is any appropriate reactions to what they're doing, and as such, it seems that. Israel's citizenry have not been able to um, decipher any issues with Israel becoming more powerful and not compromising either. And so the left doesn't really have anything to argue about in Israel in terms of compromise and peace because there's no repercussions. But you could take that wherever you want. I mentioned APAC. I mentioned the changing world order and how that might affect unconditional U.S. support for Israel and how that might affect Israel's policies both domestically and with the Palestinians and abroad, but wherever you want to go with that. There's a lot going on that's changing the situation. One is inside the United States, which we talked about. There's been a shift of support for Israel. It's the shift is from the liberal left, where what's called left here it means kind of centrist, but the liberal part of the population, the Democratic Party and the New Republic and so on. Uh, been a, but not the New Republic, but there's been a shift from uh, su strong support for Israel to critical analysis and decline of support and more recognition, limited recognition for Palestinian rights. Shift is towards the huge evangelical community, which has been politicized since the 1970s, is now a major force in American affairs in many respects. They're very pro-Israel. They're ultra anti-Semitic. They're the most extreme anti-Semites in history. Their position is that we should have a war in Israel. Armageddon will come. Christ will return. A thousand years of peace. Jews will be assigned to eternal perdition. Can't get more anti-Semitic than that. They're the strongest supporters of Israel because we want to move on to have this conflict. And when I'm talking about the end times group. It's not all evangelicals, one strong element in them, but they're strongly in support of Israel. Uh, the military and security systems strongly support Israel. They're very close to Israeli Israel's comparative advantage is in military force and repression. It support it strongly supports U.S. Uh, I mean, in many ways, take say Guatemala. Uh, the Reagan administration, uh, Guatemala was carrying out murderous repression, virtually genocidal. And Congress blocked it, uh, blocked U.S. aid, so Reagan turned to Israel who then took over arming, supporting the Guatemalan military. Uh, it still does mean you know, standard issue in the Guatemalan army, Israeli arms. Uh, the Myanmar, pretty brutal military regime, pretty much created by Israeli security systems, supported by them, armed by them, and so on. It's all over the world. As a major South Africa, Israel supported it when the United States was supporting South Africa and so on. Performed all sorts of services to the United States. It's very closely linked to U.S. Uh, military system. In fact, one of the interesting WikiLeaks revelations was a Pentagon list of uh, 
positions around the world which are of top significance. We must protect them because they're so important. I think there were about a dozen. One of them was in Haifa, the uh, Israeli uh, secu- the military headquarters, uh, the military development program, the Rafael programs in Haifa, top security. In fact, their management is in the United States because they want to be where the money is. But the linkages are extremely close. And so they have support there, support from right-wing nationalists, evangelicals. It's very different from the past. If you look at millennials, the younger generation, they're just split. Uh, very little limited support for Israel. That's changing domestically, and that's going to have effects. Internationally, the big change is what you started with, Saudi Arabia. The idea of Saudi Arabia pulling out of the U.S. Middle East system is an astonishing break from the last 80 years. Not a small thing. And it's the centerpiece. They're moving towards accommodation with Iran. Unbelievable, enormous change. Joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization doesn't mean that much in policy, but it's a symbolic blow to the United States and Israel. How they're going to work their way out of this, we don't know. It's uh... Yeah. Um, I have one last question for you, if you don't mind. And uh, that would be that it seems that the Israelis and the Palestinians' existence uh, is inevitably intertwined, no matter how anything else unfolds. And that's not to say that they've always been intertwined. I'm not getting into the the sort of demographic history about that, but as things have unfolded really since the 19, uh, uh, the, ni- uh, the late uh, 1800s, they have had a sort of intertwined history. Um, and yet the two of them live in separate worlds. Israel has political autonomy, powerful military and a strong economy, which we have gone over. You mentioned their highway systems. You mentioned um, how nice their lives are. The Palestinians, for the most part, outside of the elites that you mentioned in Ramallah, have uh, none of these things. Uh, Both societies, Israel and the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, um, are once again divided internally. And it seems that the two-state solution seems like a more of a utopian concept than a pra- practical political solution at this point. Um, what do you feel, if you have any inkling, uh, is the next step forward for these two peoples? And how can things possibly get better for each of them respectively and together before things actually get worse? Well, if we look at the situation today, there are, the debate is, there's a lot of debate. It's usually between a one state and a two state settlement. That's overlooking a third alternative, which is the most important of all, greater Israel. That's the one that's being implemented. Maybe nobody talks about it, but that's being implemented day by day, has been for the last 50 years. By now, young Israelis don't even know that there's a green line in the international border. It doesn't appear on maps. The Tel Aviv municipality recently made a proposal to put it on the map for the schools. It was banned. Can't allow the schools to know that there's an international boundary. Just get slowly integrated into Israel. You can leave, live in a comfortable villa, state supported in, say, Mala Dumim, and travel to your job on a highway for Israelis. You don't even know there's any Palestinians. You certainly don't know there's a border. You travel there, borders erased, you know, in consciousness. Well, that's the third alternative. Of these three, which ones can reach fruition? There's a lot of talk about one state, including good people, smart people who know a lot about the situation. It's very hard to imagine that Israel will ever agree 
to go out of existence and have the Jewish population be a minority in a Palestinian state. Pretty hard to imagine that. And has no international support, I should say, not even African countries, which are very jealous of sovereignty. If it could happen, be nice, you know, but in fact, I've sort of been in favor of it for 80 years in one form or another, but I think it's extremely unrealistic. Is a two-state settlement possible? I think it's possible. If the U.S. demands it, can be imposed. Not going to be pretty, but not out of the question. The alternative to that is establishing the greater Israel system more firmly. And if the U.S. begins to pull out support, Israel is in serious trouble. When it made a decision back in the 70s to favor expansion over security, that had a corollary. Corollary is you depend on the United States for survival. That goes along with the policy of expansion. Well, suppose the United States support declines. Very unclear what will happen. Uh, with the Israeli right-wing religious nationalist government, it's extremely unpredictable. I mean, they can say, we have God on our side. We don't care what happens. Well, you can see where that can lead to a state with a powerful military, huge nuclear arsenal. Actually, there is a strain of thinking in Israeli policy, which goes back to the 1950s, sometimes called the Samson complex. If we're pressed too far, we'll bring down the temple walls. Uh, in the 50s, what they said is, Nishtagea will go crazy, we'll show them. Didn't mean much then. You got a big nuclear arsenal, a huge military, it means something. There's that in the background. And that in the hands of religious nationalist extremists is a very dangerous situation. Well, these are things to keep in mind. Uh, I don't think we can make, uh, making predictions is kind of idle. We should ask what we can do about it. Well, I think what we can do is bring about, try to bring about some, I think the point you made about people not knowing anything about it is critically significant. Nothing sensible is going to happen unless people are at least aware of what's going on. So that's step one, bring about some general awareness and understanding, tear apart this uh, fantasy that's been concocted that you described before about the nature of the situation. Maybe we can then move on to things like questioning the military and economic aid until policies significantly change to uh, relieve the suffering and brutality suffered regularly by the Palestinians, maybe move towards some kind of accommodation. I should say it's not only necessary there, it's necessary on an international scale. I mean, given the problems that the world faces, unless there's an accommodation between the great powers, United States, China, Russia, unless there's an accommodation among them, we're all doomed. The policy the problems we face don't have borders. They're international. We're going to have to work together to solve them or we'll all go down together. It's not just Israel, Palestine. Well, yeah, there's uh there's a lot of directions to go with that with that. And uh it's a good play it's a it's important for us to think about that. And uh you know, I appreciate your thoughts and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Man. Yep. Good to talk to you. Good talking to you.